my next choice is Room. Now, amazing film. Yeah. Now, I mean, talk about like you know, I, I don't think anything could prepare me for for this movie really. No. You know, because you know, no poster campaign, no adverts, no trailers like could possibly kind of you know let you know what you're in for. Yeah. You know, because you, you you really, I think you, you really have to see it and. The, uh, the the main premise is basically a, a son, mother and uh, son have been uh, kept hostage in a room. You don't really know who, who by. It's kind of like a Joseph Fritzl situation. It's like they're, they're, they're trapped against their will in this in this one room, and that's how the movie starts. And then you know they spoilers that they you know eventually, not that far into the movie really, they they find a way of escaping. And any other movie about this subject, you know, would kind of end there. Mm-hmm. Be a happy ending, you know. Exactly. The, the, the movie free. that would be irresponsible of the movie to do that. You know, yeah, what this true. movie does is it's like a moment of extreme joy when they escape. You know, mm-hmm. in this really kind of you know difficult, convoluted way, and then the movie keeps going. And it shows you that no, this isn't the end. It's the of... aftermath of everything that happens. Yeah, the fallout of it. Exactly. It's like you know, victims of kidnapping are not okay. You know, it's like you know, as soon as they get yeah. out, you know. Well, it's not just that, but it's the fact that like the kid was born in the room. That was yeah. his world. He didn't know what it was like outside of it. So it was when when he eventually finds or discovers the outside world, it's such uh, an amazing like, oh my god, the world is hmm. so vast. And but then yeah, like you said, the second half of it is just trying to acclimatize to the world when you're not used to the world is such an interesting and alien experience yeah. really that was that was the way i kind of like you know read it was like you know the, the even but even those moments were kind of um, i don't want to sort of you know say that the, a child will adapt more easily but you know that like, the kid was that was kind of interesting those mm. moments of like adaptation when you see <laughs> what happens to the mother yeah definitely. who just becomes this catatonic kind of like yeah she kind of depressed into herself didn't she person yeah. it reminded me a lot of the end of uh, blue velvet you know which we watched recently in terms yeah. of when you you know you have this real kind of fairy tale picture book ending that then dissolves into this shot of um i always forget her name the woman who sings the blue velvet song uh, she's amazing i forget her name of her face and you see in her eyes just before the credits roll that nothing is ever going to be all right. You know, she's not okay yeah. now that this ordeal is over. You know, yeah. there's something deep within her eyes that she'll never be okay mm-hmm. again. And that's kind of the way I read, you know, Room. And that's what was so brilliant about it was that you know any other movie would have ended with the escape and given you a nice little postscript and said, yeah. you know, blah blah blah. This is it's definitely an analysis of the trauma that happens after it. Really. Yeah, like, which I didn't expect as yeah. well. That's what I didn't expect, yeah. and it was just amazingly acted brilliantly scary and dark and it's in a very human way and uh yeah amazing i felt it was annoying to me that if i ever wanted to try and take up acting i'm never going to have a better performance than that bloody seven-year-old or whatever he is (laughs) yeah jacob trembley he gives us such an amazing performance that you know I, I I felt that when I watched a it. True Grit, you know, and the yeah, you know, exactly. and she's Haley's the Steinfeld, best yeah. actor you've ever seen. Yeah, and she was what ten? I don't know how <laughs> yeah, old she was. Really like, you know, it's insane. Yeah. My fourth film is a Disney Pixar film. Um, it's Inside Out, and I felt it was such an important film that came out this this decade. Like, fair enough, there have been other films like Coco, which makes me cry every time I watch it. Um, but Inside Out still made me like well up and emotion like very emotional at the end when the family gets back together spoilers but <laughs> i felt like it was such an important movie to try and teach our kids the importance of how it's okay to feel sad sometimes we live in a society where um sorry i sound like i'm the joker we live in a society <laughs> um, but being happy is so prioritized and so um promoted as being the most important thing that you can be is happy and if you're sad then you're wrong and you shouldn't feel like that and that that's a large portion of the main character's like joy's message is no no sadness sadness move away move away everything's got to be joy in this young girl's life yeah but the fact is that like when you learn how to be okay with your melancholy sometimes and how that sometimes leads to happiness like you you have to you know (laughs) what does dolly parton say or what does ricky gervais say that dolly parton says Uh, you you want the rainbow Got, got a pot, pot with, with the, the rain. rain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. People say she's just a big pair of tits. Exactly. Now <laughs> on to my kid review with yes, the word right. tits in it. Um, but like, yeah, again, the importance of just like how it, it's ebbs and flows, it's peaks and troughs. And I felt like if like someone finally said that in a film where kids are 
the target audience for it and just saying like how if you're sad about something tell your parents tell talk to people make sure that that is such an important lesson to learn yeah and not only that but the animation was absolutely brilliant in it yeah. so many interesting in jokes about like how they mix up facts and opinions and say that oh it's so easy <laughs> to get these mixed up yeah or, yeah like, you know yeah. the train of thought the the, pu- the puberty button which sounds weird but you know the, it's like yeah. the big red button that's yeah. like what, what, what does this do <laughs> yeah exactly like, yeah. You know, at the very end and that's like the like, uh oh moment yeah. like, for the audience and when it goes into the the parents brains as well and you see the you know what the parents are thinking yeah do you notice the, how like joy is the main person in the kid's brain but in the mom it's sadness and the dad is anger yeah <laughs> yeah Weird, though, isn't it? yeah the, yeah the movie i mean the movie does stereotype quite i did have a problem with some of the stereotypes in the movie like sadness being overweight and having glasses for a start <laughs> Why are you I taking like, offence at that, Matt? Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. You're a lovely man. <laughs> I don't trust. But uh, no, I mean trust. Uh, you know what I mean. But yeah. but uh, yeah. But so part of me was kind of like, um, okay. But I suppose this movie was made like when when, when was it out? Two thousand and oh god, two thousand and thirteen, two thousand. So that's so that's before we were woke. This is before we were woke because I think it was made now. I don't think they make the sadness character have glasses and be fat. I think that kind of it helps that the um, the the voice actress who's Phyllis in the office kind of looks like that. But yeah, oh, she, okay. she's meant so to be like a depressed it. kind of teenage. Okay. I yeah, just remember thinking I took that a little bit not personally, but I just thought like you know that's not a good me- yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but you know the, you know anyway, I don't I don't really care. This is a very controversial one for me because I I wouldn't even consider this to be the best Dark Knight film or well, the best Batman in Nolan's trilogy. I agree. I, it's it's okay, not... Okay, that's fair enough. I um, thought that would therefore mean that it is, it's high in your ranking for the trilogy as well. I, I like the trilogy as a whole, so if it because it was in the decade, it has to be in there. I think that it's flawed. I think there's, you know, um, it's possibly overly long, especially in the third act. There's certain things, but I just, overall, I love the look of the movie, and I think partly, like I was talking before about being sentimental and sort of nostalgic about it, was it was the last movie that I felt so hyped about you know, sure. I couldn't yeah. stop talking about it. Mm-hmm. I remember trying desperately to get to a screening of it. Like I was, I was in, um, uh, I was in France when it came out, and it wasn't out there for a couple of days. You know, and I was extremely gutted that because I was on holiday, I wouldn't be get to see it. Yeah. Then when I came back to England, I was the flight was late coming in, so I missed the screening, and I had to go <laughs> to the next one. I literally got off the plane, got a taxi. Wow, you actually but, have like very detailed memories about this yeah, this event. Wow, I went to see okay, it on yeah. my own. Like you know, I was like, I was meant to be yeah. seeing it with my brother, but I was late for the screening because the flight was delayed. You see so, IMAX as well? Uh, no, just a oh, okay. just a large screen on my own, two D. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I just I just loved it. I love Bane. I think Bane's a great villain. I love the voice. The voice. I was going to say, what's your opinion on the voice? Uh, Bane. Yes, that's my name. You say it to me twice, and I crash a plane. <laughs> I'm stronger, smarter, clinically insane. <laughs> You've snapped. You've yeah. completely gone. But yeah, I really, I just loved it. I've loved Anne Hathaway as Catwoman. Um, it wasn't quite as extreme as the Heath Ledger surprise and how great he was in the yeah, casting, uh, but it was similar. You know, as I thought, oh, Anne Hathaway, really? Is this mm-hmm. going to be great? And then I thought she was brilliant. Mm-hmm. I thought she was really great. And uh, not to mention, mm, incredibly pretty. <laughs> Is that you done? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm done with that now. Yeah, I'm just going to go lie down for a while. <laughs> Boing. Oh, um, my my number three, um, which is a bit of a guilty pleasure, I'd say, is uh, Gone Girl, um, Finch's uh, film about uh, a man being framed for the murder of his wife. That's uh, a great film. I loved it. Yeah, yeah um, Finch, you can't go wrong with Fincher these not days. Not at all, especially when he teams up with Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, and their their combinations are amazing. Style, like visuals, music, everything just fitted so well with the. Um, well, fit it so well together. Um, like the Social Network, really fast-paced movie. Hey, yeah. we'll get on to that soon. We'll yeah. get on to that. But with Gone Girl, looking back, it seems like such a trashy kind of novel. Uh, like the trope of it being like, oh, halfway through the film, it's led you up to believing that, oh, Ben Affleck's this, uh, this adulterer who's going to kill his wife and he's being all violent only for it to just twist. And... Oh, I've been making it up all along. I'm framing him for the perfect murder, and oh my god! But I thought Rosamund Pike was absolutely outstanding as as amazing Amy. Yeah, I thought she she gave such an amazing performance where she was just the the Machiavellian Machiavellian mastermind behind everything, and she deserved the Oscar nomination. She she should have won it. I felt. Yeah. But it was, yeah, career defining performance for her. And Ben Affleck, I thought, was just like such a lovable schlub. Yeah, but that, kind of really flawed as well. And you yeah, were kind of like you know exactly. you, you kind of understood. 
good. Yeah, he didn't, des- a... he didn't quite deserve the, the the psychopathic kind of homicidal you know response that she had. But no, like it was, no. but he he didn't deserve much less than that. True, but especially like the ending, like where the, there's so much debate between me and my friends about whether he deserves the ending he gets, where he's stuck in this loveless marriage with this horrible woman who framed for murder, yeah. with this potentially fake baby on the way that yeah. may be even Neil Patrick Harris's kid, and yeah. it's like all for the sake of like appearing to be good in the eyes of the media and yeah. appearing to be the perfect couple and how much they're willing to like try and bring out in each other and like you make me a better person because I'm always on my toes and trying to outthink you yeah. and like how much it's turned from such a idyllic marriage into one of just pure antipathy and hatred between each other yeah. it's such a horrible feeling by the end of it i've got a friend who can't watch it because it makes <laughs> yeah. him so angry about how he's how ben affleck's character ends up but just the ending where he just like throws her up against the wall and she says i'm the cunt you married yeah and like i'm the cunt that you you wanted me to be i'm the girl that like this is who i am yeah rather than the whole be the perfect girlfriend thing she has in the car she's like saying goodbye to her life is so it, it's like a fate you know, worse isn't... than death isn't it it's one of those things yeah, where it's like it's you're stuck in this personal health yeah which yeah. is which is infinitely scarier than like you know anything and and the movie twists and turns and then it twists the other way and you kind of don't really know like where it's going and mm. yeah and I thought it was it was brilliant and um the it had the really brutal that scene with Neil Patrick Harris it was oh, kind the of death scene yeah it yeah. was kind of like uh, what, was that, what was that movie with the <laughs> with the legs and the um Sharon Stone Basic Instinct? Yeah, kind yeah. of that kind of vibe, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just that. getting it from that. <laughs> you didn't see, but obviously he might just, like, parted his legs. <laughs> it was like, what's the film with that with Sharon Stone? I'm like, oh, yeah, that film. <laughs> yes, that death scene yeah. is really brutal, especially because the music just increases to a tempo, which is just very, like... Yeah. And it's like, oh, my God, this is the worst thing that could possibly have happened. And also, like, Neil Patrick Harris is, like, the only person in that movie is worse than her, and you kind of you kind of want it to happen to him, in a way. Kind you know, it's of, like this yeah. thing of, like, you're kind of rooting... There's, what I've, I've noticed a trend when I was uh, looking at our top ten lists uh, today that there's a lot of anti-hero movies. Yeah, movies yeah, with good it, you point. know that are basically you know the leads are. <laughs> What's it say anti- about us? I guess. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I know it's scary. Oh, uh-huh. So my next choice is the lady in the van. A lot of these movies that like I've chosen are based on just how much they move me emotionally. Mm-hmm. I'm not a huge Alan Bennett fan. I didn't really know much of his his work, his poetry, his like his plays or anything. Um, but the the movie itself, it, I kind of love the idea of this kind of misunderstood, you know, quote unquote, crazy woman on the high street, you yeah. know, shouting at the the, the crazy world, crazy cat lady, or something. crazy cat lady, and that you, it's very easy to forget that you know these people, you know, are you know everybody started off as uh, you know an infant who had absolutely no mental health problems or you know anything like that, and just how people just take this downward spiral and just become you know sort of people perceived to be undesirable and 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 i think that the bits that looked into her past and she talked about music and like being a you know great musician yeah. and all this and just those those scenes where she's talking about how she was um it's just before her death it's the night before her death scene where she's talking about you know how she was in the convent playing music and that she was discouraged from doing so because that was an avenue that the devil could creep through uh even though she loved playing it you know she was discouraged that that scene moves me so much in the way it's performed by Maggie Smith and and uh, also the movie's very funny there's funny moments in it it's really well acted and but ultimately it's just incredibly moving and that's why I picked it I definitely understand like fair enough the placement in your top 10 surprised me but mm when I did see it, it was in my top ten of that year. I yeah. I loved the film. I thought it was absolutely be- like beautiful and brilliant. Like you said, going into the past of these certain undesirables and how they got to that point yeah. is always going to be like a bit of a you know, you know, frog in the throat moment where yeah. it's just like, yeah. Oh God, if that was my grandma, or if that was yeah. my relative, like I wouldn't have liked to see her like that. Yeah. And she um again, trying to say that Maggie Smith gave a great performance is like obvious these days. Yeah. But she gave such an amazing performance where she's usually the dowager or you know the 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 hoity-toity woman yeah but seeing her in this position of um undesirable in the community but still yeah. having that oh don't you know who i am sort of yeah. thing was such a yeah. such well, an amazing it, it was that fine line it just shows that you know with the right treatment and the right care this woman might have been an affluent mm-hmm. you know star musician of the of the stage and screen or whatever but because she was essentially tortured from quite a young age she became mentally ill and yeah. went downhill and became 
lived a lifestyle of you know an alternative lifestyle that was you know seen as undesirable and true and just sort of forgotten about and mm. you know and whatever and uh, no, that's not even to mention the Alan Bennett connection, which is this crazy story of him taking on this stranger that he didn't even know and yeah. letting her live in his driveway for, was it like 18 years or Something more? Something like that, yeah. Uh, so it's a great story anyway, but I just think the humanity of it just kind of just got to me, you know, just that, you know, it made me change the way I thought about people and, and people's plights. And, you know, no one's born like that. It's just like, you know, what... It's forced upon you. It's really, forced upon it? you by, yeah. you know... It's like it's a, there's a line in Red Dragon that always sticks with me. It's like, this guy wasn't born a killer. He was made that way, way by years and years of physical and mental abuse. Hmm. You know, and that's kind of where, you know, that that's what I kind of took from that movie. And so, yeah, that's one of... That's why I chose it. No, fair play. Now, coincidentally, my second uh, favourite film is also your favourite film. So this way we can actually combine the two hey. and uh, talk about it together. But... um it is David Fincher's The Social Network. Great. Yeah, released in 2010, and just basically all about the, well, supposedly, the uh, the origins of Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg and Eduardo Saverin's creation of it and the downfall of like, how, how it went from being this internet... Well, no, sorry, it's not even the downfall. It's the downfall of their friendship, not the, of the website. It's as the website's just taking off, really, and going yeah. out to different continents. But... I find it not even the Facebook thing, but just the relationship between Zuckerberg and Saverin. And yeah. if you put um, Justin Timberlake's uh, character in as well, can't remember his name now, but yeah, um, yeah it, it, just how something so positive could be turned yeah. into something so backstabbing. Yeah. And yeah, Aaron Sorkin's screenplay all the way through, I think, is so biting and so original and so just. He, like with the West Wing or Studio 60 or, you know, the newsroom, he's just got such a talent for doing snappy dialogue where everything is, like, the personality is brought across, but also, like, facts and interesting things that you need about the plot. And I felt like the performances are brilliant. I think Jesse Eisenberg was amazing as as Mark. He kind of sums up everything about him that isn't really, he's not really a people person and he's all about tech and he's all about trying to you know trying to i don't know it's it's weird it kind of spoke to me on a personal level because i empathize with him when he gets spurned by people and told that he can't do it or that he's he's not good enough to get in the porcelain or he's not yeah. good enough to get in the harvard things that it's like fine i'll prove to you that i can do it yeah and like when he meets his his ex and she Rooney mara who's just like good luck with your video game or something yeah. he just <laughs> yeah. turns around and says we have to expand yeah and he's, he's <laughs> yeah. taking this slight as more fuel to his fire and trying yeah. to get better at it and i i appreciated that in that and i was like yeah that's how you should try and take um negative actions and, and tragedies in your life try and make them into a better thing and try and make something of them and that's why it kind of stuck to me not only that as well but the cinematography yeah <laughs> you know everything about it finch's direction just the the kind of the dark brownness to everything yeah just, the, the really palette good... was amazing it was yeah. like fincher to the extreme wasn't exactly it? yeah but you see it now in like mind hunter or like even said he did it in seven and, oh, and yeah and uh, the game but um even in alien in like well. you can see it in alien three it's already there you know and that's you what get a reference in yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know it is though you know and that's yeah, what people yeah. kind of you know I, I think that's it. one of the reasons why it doesn't get enough credit is because it really is Fincher's vision in is, is there you know whether yeah. he intended it to be or not but it's there and um, yeah but what I took away from the social network every time I watched it I felt like anything was possible I think yeah. that's that was the kind of overriding feeling you know for better or for worse if you really want to do something you can do it you know and it's possible and uh, but also like looking back on it now and you know seeing you know everything that's happened with the real facebook and you know how it's you know it's kind of starting to fall from grace just the this sort of time and a place i think it's that interesting thing of you know lightning in a bottle at yeah. certain moments in history you mm -hmm. know where just the, you were just absolutely at the right crux history for this thing to take off also it's a period film now which is really weird when you watch yeah. it you know because you watch it set in 2003 it starts it opens with the white stripes yeah you know which is just so nostalgic because that was exactly our era when we were kind of teenagers coming up starting to listen to well, alternative music yeah. and really get into that stuff and this was all going on kind of you know at that i know time. what you mean it is like we judge today's society like pre or post facebook like yeah, it's, yeah, it's made such a cultural impact that this is such a pre or post social networking. We yeah, call exactly. It, yeah. But it feels like this is such an important milestone film. It's like I don't know, like for the generation of the nineteen forties and fifties, like how the creation of the atom bomb, like or something yeah. like changed society, or you know, different different milestones in each society has them, or in each generation. And ours was the creation of Facebook. Yeah. So just like the the backstabbing and the the 
the politics behind it is so much more interesting than how oh, a guy got an idea about doing a dating site but for <laughs> Harvard people yeah. so like and yeah like and the the technology behind it about like I thought I genuinely thought that um, Army Hammer had a twin brother yeah, me too. Yeah, I like when I was like, oh my God, that's that's the same person done twice? How? How has he done that? <laughs> that's the best line in the movie where he's like, I'm six foot two and there's two of me. There's two of me. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, there's great lines. Aaron Sorkin screenplay. I can't I can't highlight it enough. But um, is it, Isn't um, the guy from Jaws in it as well? What's his name? The um, the guy on the... Oh, I forget his name. Not not the uh, not the captain of the boat, but the, the second the guy from Close Encounters. I think he plays the Richard dean. Dreyfus. No, Richard Dreyfus no. is the dean, no, is he not? No, no, of the no. Dreyfus, Dreyfus is not. He's similar, but he's, that's not him at all. Now, you sure? Yeah, yeah. One second, I'm pretty sure it is. Oh, Matt, I'm right. Trust me. Are you sure? Yeah, Dreyfus ain't in this. <laughs> Give me that face, like you know. I'm definitely recording this. Yep. <laughs> this is interesting, isn't it? But, but, but yeah, while you're looking, um, <laughs> so the social networks soundtrack I still listen to this day. Anytime I want to get some work done, I listen to Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross's score, and like the pounding bass of just like when you see the um, the frats and the Harvard um, clubs and societies yeah. having these truckfuls of women come oh, over and stuff really and it's just pounding scenes, little yeah. ding, 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 ding. or just like the opening when he's walking through the Harvard um, the Harvard campus and it's just like little piano music just like very subtly going on oh I, lo- I love that intro where it's just getting yeah, from it's one lovely stuff. Well, I don't know why it works so well but it's just like getting from A to B you know just getting from one stage to the other yeah and it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's brilliant musically. Um, there's the scene in the club where he's talking to uh, Justin, uh, who plays the guy who invented. Uh, was it Sean Sean Parker? Sean Parker, then. Thank you. I couldn't uh, think of it. Yeah, but uh, invented he, Napster. Napster. And yeah. uh, he's talking about him like, you know, this is our time, and they're shouting at each other in the club. Yeah. And it's just brilliant because it's like you know, it's very unique, it's very realistic. You know, yeah. like you know, in movies when there's a club scene. Usually people are just, you know, kind of talking at a normal level. At our volume. Yeah. And so the music is like lowered so that you can hear it in the audience. But there's there is pounding music and he is trying to give him such an uh, an interesting analogy or allegory, I should say, about how you shouldn't give up on something that is worthwhile. Yeah. And Boulder Wilde is like, we're doing this together. Yeah. This is <laughs> yeah. really good. This yeah. is our time. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's brilliant. Sonically, it's like it's a really great movie for sound design. For the music, yeah, the the music uh, choices are just perfect. It yeah, just all I works all the time. And yeah. even the the whole of the Mountain King that's been remixed by Trent Reznor when they're doing the the boat race, mm. I think that is such an interesting little techno version of it. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Except as an English out. audience, you can't help think of Alton Towers when you watch. Of course, yeah. <laughs> but I'd search out that scene anyway. If you haven't seen the Social Network, that interesting boat race is uh, yeah, is very well done. It's all filmed with this sort of tilt shift. Camera and like it just yeah it looks great it looks yeah. amazing really good film and now we've talked about your my second favorite your favorite but now for my favorite film uh, I'd say the one that's had much uh, such an impact on me and I try and watch it as often as I can is uh, Scott Pilgrim vs the World ah now this I understand is a very cult status film not many people saw it in the cinema it didn't do well box office wise and <laughs> it's kind of gained an underground status because of that but I think it is one of the most incredibly made films of this past 10 years um i feel like so much so much love attention and detail has gone into edgar wright's direction um trying to adapt it from a comic book but doing it in such a way that it feels like a live action comic book and not only a live action comic book but it feels like a live action video game as well there's so many video game references um just like at the beginning where he goes to the toilet and there's the p-bar from uh the sims that goes down the fact that like the uh, the music from legend of zelda like welcomes you to the film um the fact that like he gets a 64 punch combo on the first evil x um just there's so many different references and so many different easter eggs and little nods to the audience that every time you watch it you will see something new or just the attention to detail about how every single evil x has a number associated with them and they will have like um one x on on them for the first evil x two's always around lucas lee uh, Todd has Todd Ingram has three on him, but just like the ideas about like the vegan police, um, yeah, and I, obviously I, I've got, <laughs> for anyone who hasn't seen this film, I'm just going off on one about all the different references. But it is so it's so deep and so I don't know filled with so much that you can always get something new out of it. And I I love that something was given this amount of detail and love, and I feel like that comes across. And I feel like that is something that that you can appreciate and. I just think that it's such a good 
it's such a good film. I know it sounds like so blase and bland to say it's well, such a good film, it's but it's a, just... It's a summary, isn't it? You just can't, you know, it just works, like everything, and it works. I, I, I see it in the same sort of category as The Watchmen, in the way that when I first watched it, I wasn't prepared for it at all. I no, had no same. idea what yeah, it I had was. no idea, but I was just smiling all the way through. Yeah. I, didn't smile, I didn't stop smiling from the first to the last bit. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your Watchmen comparison. No, no, yeah, yeah it's, it, it just, it, it, it kind of... I didn't know what I was walking into. I think, you know, at least with The Watchmen, I knew it was a, a vaguely a superhero concept. Yeah. Is this the Zack Snyder, not the TV series? That's no, the, no, the, the, the Zack, Zack Snyder, Snyder original. Yeah. So, so therefore, for me, personally, it got better on repeat viewings. Mm-hmm. Uh, same with Scott Pilgrim. Yeah. Uh, and um, I don't lord it as much as you do. And I'm actually not that big an Edgar Wright fan as a director. Okay. Um, I think it's because I'm a bit of a zombie purist at heart. So, you know, when Shaun of the Dead came out, there was bits of it that, you know, I liked seeing attention brought to Romero movies yeah. but I was just like yeah, it's just a bit daft and a bit silly and, and, and I like silly <laughs> things be, but yeah I think when you you know I like silly things uh, original silly things but I think you know when you're a purist about a genre it's not like I took offence to it or anything I just you know I just you know when I'm watching Shaun of the Dead I'm just like I'd much rather be watching Day of the Dead you know the original yeah, okay. but so and I think that's with, with Edgar Wright's direction there's just something that doesn't quite hit with me. I don't quite know what it is. Um, I love Spaced. I love. I like Shaun of the Dead. Um, didn't really like Hot Fuzz. Don't really care about the you world's, know, end. world's End. Baby um, Driver? Yeah. <sighs> Yeah, Kevin Spacey. No, 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 no. no. Oh well, yeah. No, no, that's fine. That could be said about any film. But... Yeah, I know, I know, no, yeah. but no, I just, I didn't. It, I don't know what it is. I don't know. I, I need to look into that because I feel like I'm, you know, I'm just, you know, I don't. I feel like I'm. Taking... If you watch them with me, I'm pretty sure I will. I am so much a big fan of Edgar Wright's, and my enthusiasm may come across and may yeah. infect you maybe a little bit if I'm just obviously not going to be like, oh, did you see that, Matt? Oh, yeah. look, he's, <laughs> yeah. it's the, the same jukebox noise from the other films, you know, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that. But. In terms of Scott Pilgrim, I think that it's such a master a masterpiece in terms of n- like not a single shot is missed or wasted. Mm. There's no time that isn't either moving the story along or giving you some character detail or you know everything is used so well and the characters are so well defined and everything you need to know about them is yeah, and the music is so amazing as well. I do love Michael Cera in like everything. You know, yeah. so he's, he's just a great actor. Like, yeah. I do love him. But that's the thing. I feel like you'd, you're not supposed to love him at first. He is a dick. Mm. But then he learns how to be a better person. His arc is brilliant all the way through. Mm. And but yeah, just like yeah, the music from from Beck, the music from um, Metric when they're playing the Clash at Demon Head, the amount of actors who are in that film who are amazing as well. You've got Chris Chris Evans, uh, yeah, Chris Evans. You've got Anna Kendrick. You've got Aubrey Plaza. You've got uh, <laughs> God. I'm just like oh, uh, Jason Schwartzman, who's Amazing as the bad guy Gideon. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm I'm venting too much, aren't I? It's a it's a good it's a good movie. <laughs> it's a good movie. It's a good, it's a good, good movie. movie. Yeah. It's a good movie. Go watch it. Oh, by the way, uh, Richard Dreyfus wasn't in uh, Social I Network. Fucking knew it. I told you, no <laughs> Dreyfus in that. No Dreyfus for you. Yeah, no. Don't even look like him. Come on now. I know. <laughs> never, never doubt me, sir. I am yeah. the MD and IMDb. That's not why I call a close count. Oh. And that about does it. Thank you very much for listening to us uh, vent about how amazing the past 10 years were and these uh, 20 or 19 films especially. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, like, subscribe, comment on what your favourite films of the past decade were underneath. And Matt, it's been lovely chatting to you. Say goodbye, Matt. Bye, Matt. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.